welcome. My name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awaken the Dream. My friends, I have to talk about Joel Goldsmith again today because he is still my mentor and I am learning so much from him. He's a mystic and he has written so many books, 20th century mystic, a businessman, a Christian science healer. He created the Infinite Way Movement. Uh, everything is about how can we become a mystic? How can we learn to meditate? So the recommendations at the back of this book recommend that if you really, really want to learn the art of meditation, which is the name of this book that I'm going to talk about, it's really good. It has, it's just been wonderful. It's a book that I probably will reread like I do all of Joel's books because every time I reread one, I feel I've never read it because it's so profound, so life-changing, every page, every paragraph. He is more famous today than he was in the time of his life. He's a, a hundred years ahead of his time and uh, all of the wonderful folks that are working with healing right now are commenting and uh, folks are really noticing these monologues and I appreciate that. So let's get into meditation. How do we do this? It is an art and it requires a, a, quite a challenge. Joel might say it's the simplest thing to do and the hardest thing to do. So I agree with both. The principle sounds so simple. Go within, embrace God and your home. The hardest thing to do is in our human nature, we thrive on our senses. From when we were babies, we had rattles, we had books, we had distractions. We had a mind that just gobbled up all of the trinkets of the world, shall we say all the things to do. It seemed to be the way that, I don't know, we, we survived childhood, then the TV, whatever it was, there were distractions, hardly what you would call meditation. So we've got to look at the human mind first to see where to go from there. So in that state of being human, we're in a world, we're in a dimension where our senses of seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, all of the, the trinkets of the world, the money, the prestige, the perfect car, all the things that we're taught, and we are all taught this, are important in our lives. What we have to strive for on this earth plane, what really will make us happy? So here we are. And as Buddha says, all of this is impermanent. All of these thrills come and go. We think they're great for a while, we may get a raise and be ecstatic for a while, but before you know it, they are not the gods that are really involved in our happiness. That is not the infinite way movement, that is what the world of the third dimension looks like. So how are we going to go into this art of meditation? How do we cut through all of this stuff in our mind? And that's where Joel's right. <clears throat> it's the simplest thing and it's the hardest thing because you have to remember, you have to be intent. <clears throat> you have to strive. You have to make it your intention and the harder that the intention is, the more you want it, the more you will get it. <clears throat> so that means if you are a seeker, very often seekers are folks that have a life that wakes them up through a lot of trauma. He makes this point in this book that often the harder we fall, the more we rise. The more we are challenged and hurt and abandoned and injured or are sick, whatever the challenges are, the more we need to reach in, the more we need to find out, where can I find some peace? Where can I heal? So let's remember that. If we've had some problems, it's all for the good. All right, so here we are with very busy minds with mystics that have been on this planet forever that we know about. We know about Jesus and Moses and Elijah and uh, even Joel and Mary Baker Eddy. I mean, we've had mystics. We've had mystics on this earth plane that you'll never know about, that didn't write anything. But they added their light to consciousness, which is this abundant, incredible, intense energy that just, just emotes love to a point where there are no words for what that feels like. 
So Jesus contributed. Everybody was an instrument of, of the divine consciousness that created us. This, this very creative force that individually took every one of us and put us here to do something. So we have those that, like Jesus, who wrote and taught Buddha. Um, but you know the interesting thing about these mystics that made their mark? If you really study how, who got their message, you would find very few. I mean, t we're talking two or three to mobs of people. They were offered crowns, jewels, money. They were offered everything, and they knew that was not what was going to make them happy. They needed, they needed to go deeper because of who they were and what they needed to find out for peace. Okay, so we've got these unknown mystics, we have these known mystics, and we've had mystics all over the world forever. And they're out there right now contributing. Awaken the Dream is about having folks here who have found a very special niche on shedding light in the world. And people are doing it everywhere. Whether they get famous with it or don't does not matter in the world of the spirit. It's the practice that we need to talk about. We need to talk about the experience of what it feels like and then what are the fruits of meditation. Let's talk about the practice. I mentioned it's hard work. It means if you don't want it now, don't worry about it because you can't force an intention. When you're ready, the light will go on. You'll hit some sort of rock bottom where you have to go within and say help. You know, there must be somebody I can cry to, some energy, some creative force that put me here that can help me. So when we reach these rock bottoms and we reach in, we need with the art of meditation to learn to find this universal consciousness. So practice is the first thing we talk about in this book, the art of meditation. Joel suggests you find at least three periods a day. Just always start the day. Go within, embrace spirit. Ask to be a servant. Ask only to hear a voice. Ask to feel a lift. Ask to know the universe. You can call it God. You can call it spirit. You can call it nirvana. You can name it anything you want. It really doesn't matter. But you hire power. But you need to find a way to embrace that experience. So Joel says, practice, practice, practice. And Joel, oh my goodness, he practiced and practiced and practiced. And it took him years. It took him years to even get that glimpse. But he got it. And then he began to get it more frequently. And then before he knew it, he was actually living it. All right, so there's, <laughs> there's what's important. The discipline of soul is in the front of the book, every single book that uh, Joel has written. Discipline of soul. If you want to be illumined, you've got to go after it. You've got to want it. So there you are, folks, wherever you are, whether you're enlightened, whether you're interested, whether you're not. If you, I'm here to help you if you want to intensify. You do need to take responsibility for the work. And it's, it is challenging. You will find that your mind and the universe of so the earth plane keeps bombing in on you. And before you know it, you're distracted with something else. Something's come up where you're not feeling as detached and as at peace as you could be. And of course, when we really think about where meditation takes us, it takes us to a loving place and a place where you don't overreact to everything. You're not emotional about everything because you know who you are. You know, even though you're in the body and you're here on the earth plane where all we see is trauma, we see wars, we see killings, we see robberies, we see terrible abuse. Okay, so you know what that really means? That means we're not, we haven't found God yet. Not all of us. Some of us have, but obviously if we knew God, who doesn't know about all these evil things, he does not promote that, then we have work to do to close time to work on pulling all our light energy together so that we will form the circle around the earth and before you know it, it will overcome all the evil here. And Joel's made an interesting point too. If you are awake, if you are illumined, you could be tortured, you could be at war, you could be in a, ter in a prison, you could be in a terrible place and be at peace. 
So you see, inner peace has everything to do with what's within you. The whole journey here with the planet that we're on that needs work is to go within to be of help. We're to be instruments. We're to serve. Our prayer can be, what would you have me do? I've been on the path. Some people come in on the path who've been here before, who know it well and keep growing with it. There are some that are newcomers that are just getting their feet wet. We'll never know and it doesn't matter. We have every stage of development around us. And we don't have to know where anybody else is. We have to just take responsibility for our vision and that is love your neighbor. So we always get back to the core commandment. If you really could love your neighbor as yourself, and that can be where the challenge is with a lot of folks that you really are struggling with. But let me see if I can help you with that principle. If you know you're whole, complete and perfect, and frankly, it sounds like a pipe dream, but you truly are right now in paradise. You are whole, complete, everything here, truly the truth is it's perfect. Everything is divine. Everything you have, that you have to leap into that place. You have to dare to believe it. And you can only believe it when you experience it over and over again, where you become more detached, more loving, more peaceful, and your neighbor begins to look more like someone you love. Now, if they challenge you and make it hard for you to see that, your job is to see it anyway. Just step away from it. Know who they are inside, because we're all created. We're all part of this consciousness. So we're looking in a mirror. They are us. We are them. We're in this together. Whether they're awake, whether they're dense does not matter. Your job for your inner peace, for you to be in paradise, like that first chapter in Genesis, for you to have everything, everything's perfect, whole, health, wonderful, abundance, everything. You really got to, you got to go there. You've got to work on that. So there are teachers, when you get those challenges, just let, let yourself know, okay, I'm going to step up to the plate. I'm going to see what's really going on and see what a difference you make in the lives around you. Yes, the lives around you will look different. People will see the twinkle in your eye. They'll pick up on your peace or your grin or your joy uh, or your selflessness or your long suffering personality where you just tolerate and understand. You're not selfish. You're loving, you're giving, and you're able to do that because you meditate. And it's an art. It's an art. And artists create form where their gifts come through and singers and plumbers. Everybody has something where they can be totally in the Garden of Eden with whatever they do. Not everybody comes in to be a teacher. You can be a teacher in a very strange profession where you wouldn't think to find a spiritual teacher, but you really are. Because with the love that pours through you and for how you see everybody around you, you're as powerful as anybody else who's in a pulpit. So you can find inner peace in church, in a synagogue, sitting in front of Buddha, uh, by spiritual masters. You can read a book that can really enlighten you. Uh, you can hear a teacher. You can go to a workshop. There's so many ways to be enlivened in the spirit. Don't overlook the fact that everybody might gravitate to something very unique. And so what's unique about that is um, grace. Let's talk about the most important part of the art of meditation and getting into the infinite way material. And to be in paradise, you have to recognize the most important point is there is grace waiting for you. So what's grace? We've heard about the grace of God. Grace is for every individual in a different way, in a different form. The almighty, the universal love knows each one of us and what we need. So Joel is always saying, please don't plead for what you think you need because there is a loving force that knows much more than you do. Don't even bother. He's, he's not a human being. It's, it's a force that's beyond this plane. It's in another dimension that's way beyond you communicating and, and begging for things. It's not going to work. What you need to beg for is to be a servant, to hear that still small voice, and to give thanks constantly for the grace that's given you because everything that you need comes to you when you get out of the way. So don't get in the way by saying, I got to have this and this will make me happy. That job will make me happy. Oh, if only my daughter were married or whatever comes up, 
let that alone. I mean, that's just not what it's about. God is taking care of all of these other needs, all the grace that everyone else needs, they are getting. So leave it alone, ask to be an instrument, ask what you are to do, because you want the peace, so you can help others. Okay, so we've talked about the mystics that have been here forever. We've, talk about, we've talked about grace, as I said, the most important principle. Now, let's talk about the experience of sitting in the presence. Joel practiced and practiced, and he, he's just so vulnerable, and it's so wonderful to hear that some people get it in a minute, and some people labor forever, and they come in with too much density, so it, it's a little harder, and some come in old souls, and it's easier. But whatever it takes doesn't matter. You have to be disciplined. Okay, so Joel persisted in finding the grace, and after a while, he began to notice that that voice kept coming to him sharp as a blade, speaking to him about where to go and what to do, dictating his writings. He became a channel for all of those books and tapes that he put out. He had his mission and he loved his students so much that he knew on the path, we have to talk and we have to teach. So he prided himself and he loved his students more than anybody because they all worked together. And here's another point about Joel. Privacy. I always have to remember this. You don't take your pearls and throw them out there anywhere. Because if you live on the other side or you're living within or you're in a dimension that may be not familiar to a lot of folks, you really ought to be a little careful about who you share that with. The miracles that come into your life, very appropriate to share with like-minded friends who are on the path, who have been studying like you have, that you trust and that you can celebrate with. That's the perfect place to go. But do you know what, friends? The truth of the matter is, to be enlightened, you don't do it with another. You can celebrate with two and three, but the job is individual. So only you can do it for you. No one else can go inside you and enlighten you and give you grace but God. So you have to be the one that sits and that asks to be a servant and, and has patience with this head that may be carrying on about your grocery list. You have to laugh at it. Don't get mad at yourself because that will attach the problem to you even more. You need to just laugh at it, let it go, because if you ignore it by just not making anything out of it, sure enough, it will disappear. Before you know it, you're at rest. And you know how you're gonna know? We've talked about the practice. We're now talking about the experience. The experience is a lift and a shift that you get within yourself, a warmth. Sometimes it's a voice. Sometimes there's a problem that you have all of a sudden that feels resolved or you know what to do something about. It's just a little miracle. And those miracles, the more you keep plugging in, are just constant. God is speaking to you all the time. Miracles are, are normal. They're happening all the time. You have to just realize who you are. Now that's the challenge. So you've got to take your meditation practice seriously so you can sit in grace. Okay, let's get back to grace because the experience of grace feels, you know what, I like to think of the heart as being grace. I feel something. The heart is that very special organ that seems beyond anything else in the body. It, it, uh, it's intuitive, it feels, it knows things. Uh, I get feelings that are nice, that are overwhelming, that I can sometimes laugh at, cry at. Tears are wonderful for joy. Tears of gratitude because you cannot believe either you've gotten the voice or some miracle has happened. I mean, walking on water, I like to call it, but it's just what your journey can be day in and day out. Again, got to practice. You've got to have the experience and patience. If, if you're not getting a click or a shift, Go back to doing something else. Come back and try again. Come back and try again, but be persistent. If you wake up at two or four in the morning, go for it. Perfect time. First thing in the morning is wonderful before you go to bed at night. Any time that you think of it, and you want to be on automatic. You want your practice to build to the point where, oh my gosh, all of a sudden, something is speaking through me all the time. Let's talk about that. Yeah, what is that voice that seems to be from somewhere else, but now feels like me, which I think is pretty interesting, where your thoughts are, are channeled, 
where you more consistently feel like you're walking on water and you're speaking a truth that someone's channeling to you all the time. I mean, that is a place we can go to. And, and, and if we've got this experience of warmth and peace and we go to really, really wanting it, the intention has to be very sincere. If we really, really want it and we sit quietly all by ourselves, be alone because that's the only way you're going to find the infinite way, the only way you're going to find consciousness, the vast love that pulses within you can only be found with you alone. So no, don't expect your neighbor to give it to you, a book to give it to you. You can be inspired, yes, but the real work is done within. So do your homework, feel the experience, and now let's move on to what the fruits could be. What could be the fruits of meditation? Well, you could be joyful, long-suffering, kind, hospitable, sweet, loving, uh, making nothing out of a, what looks like a horrendous problem. It just rolls off your back and you might chuckle. People notice those things. If you don't get riled up, it's like, what kind of a core do you have or have you worked on that is so strong in your knowledge of who someone else is in this body of oneness? We're all in one Christ mind. The Christ is all of us. What was in Jesus is in us. That mind, as he kept telling his disciples, please, it is the Father speaking. He called consciousness the Father. You call it what you want. The Father is dictating to me. Please listen to me. This is not me, the man speaking. I am being told what to say and do. And believe me, he was challenged, as we all know. And he overcame in, in the wilderness. He accepted his job, his sacrifice, because he knew he was whole. He knew he was eternal. And he knew he lived forever. So we all have to remember that. We never had a beginning. There will be no end. We have been forever. We always have been. In that old Garden of Eden, we just decided to see two worlds. We decided to see temptation. We decided, gee, why don't I try that? That looks like, I'd like to separate myself from God. Excuse me. Uh, I'd like to find another God. I'd like to find something that looks like it's, yeah, it's got some, it's, it tinsels and it's sparkly and hey, that might give me a high of some kind. Maybe I'll be addictive. Maybe I'll find something I can hang on to. And that's another trait, by the way, of the fruits. You're, you're not addictive. If you were, you're, you get over it. Addictions leave you when you, when you sit in uh, consciousness, interestingly enough, because there's no room for them. They're not any fun anymore. You might go to an addiction because you want to blot something out and it's a way of, of, of numbing yourself for a moment. But as you may notice, it doesn't hold up. It's, it's impermanent. It leaves you. So that's kind of a teacher for you. Addictions are our teachers and those are good things. Oh, my friends, I'm blabbing and I have five minutes, so I'm just going to try and continue with um, Oh, the tinsels of the world, the trinkets. Let's talk more about the fruits. Okay, we're kind, we're loving, we're peaceful. We're easy and we have a great sense of humor. We're easy to get along with, we're compassionate, we're helpful. We serve, that's big. I mean, I don't care how it is. Uh, we serve, we're here to help one another. We're here to help one another because as we serve and we bring the light into our consciousness and we send it out, we give it out, we are moving into the oneness that we're all involved with, that all the mystics knew about. There weren't many of them, but they're out there now and they're growing. So we join our light with the light that's building. And as you may notice that we are doing more for the world now and we have more knowledge of who we are now spiritually than we ever have. We're growing and we're changing. All those studies, all that work that folks have done, all that praying without ceasing, all that dying daily. You die daily to all the things that you're attracted to that you think you are. Anything that appeals to you that is of your ego, something you want to get famous for, fame, wealth, whatever that is, you got to die to that because that's a dead end. That's not even not fun. It's not rewarding. Yes, the practice takes you to the experience of the warmth and then you become the fruits 
and people will come to you. Now, in his last chapter, he talks about he could see groups of people coming together with this knowledge and really joining their energies together. And I, I'm involved in that myself. I f speak firsthand of joining minds and not the mind, but the soul. Yeah, the, the infinite way is about the heart. It's about feeling. It's, dis it's dismissing the prattle. It's working way beneath or above, what, however you want to take it. It's going down to the core. It's going into eternity. Yeah, you all want to go to eternity. I think it's a grand place to, to shoot for, um, where you've got everything. Everything is supplied, and it doesn't have to be huge. It can just be wonderful health or bad health, whatever it is. You accept what it is. You expect what means you've got. You, you accept where you are because you're not putting everything into this plane. Oh, in our last two minutes. Okay, so we're not here forever in this body. Now, I know you know this from this program. We are spirit. We're eternal. So whatever we're living in, this dimension, this body that we lumber around in, will age. Yeah, we go through being a kid, then we become middle-aged, we get old. Um, we stay busy, hopefully. We perk along and we, we find missions. We find reasons to be very alive. And then when we are not here anymore, that's fine. And hopefully our friends who really know and love us will know we're just transitioning. We're going off to do something else where we'll find out when that happens, but we'll pick up where we left off. And, and I say that because the work that we do here is permanent. You don't just do all this hard work and overcome and die daily to all the things that don't work for you. The reward is whatever you are is always with you. It always was. So in our last minute, my friends, I recommend The Art of Meditation by Joel S. Goldsmith. He's my mentor. Uh, I feel I just can't give enough thanks for what I'm learning about who I am from this man. And I recommend him. And I appreciate your letting me carry on here today about The Art of Meditation. And I will talk to you again soon. Thank you.